Hello, everyone, and welcome to BlackBerry Silence. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Please welcome our special guest, John Olsik from the Enterprise Strategy Group, also known as ESG. He is a senior principal analyst and fellow, plus our very own Brett Lenmark, senior product marketing manager. In this webinar, John and Brett will address the most critical consideration when evaluating and investing in AI-based cybersecurity platforms. As the modern tech surface grows more complex, the importance of an effective AI-based solution has never been greater. So without further ado, I would like to kick off the webinar and please welcome John Olsik from ESG. He will share his findings, leveraging machine learning for the endpoint security. Over the last, I'd say, Four or five years, we've seen a lot of changes in endpoint security driven by both uh, demand side requirements and supply side innovation. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And we've seen changes in the cybersecurity technology space over the last two years, and that continues. And we'll talk about that as well. So this is my agenda. I'll start with a situational analysis, talk about what we're seeing out in the market. And, and as I mentioned, what we've seen over the last few years that's driving changes. I'll talk about the move toward artificial intelligence and machine learning, and hopefully separate some of the hype from reality because art, my, my feeling is artificial intelligence or, or really machine learning is making a tremendous difference in cybersecurity, but it's been, um, it's become sort of overpromised. Um, there's a misunderstanding about what the technology is and clearly silence has been on top of this for a number of years. So hopefully we shed some light on what machine learning is and how it's really used in a security setting. Um, we'll talk about optimized endpoint security. Some of the changes we see um, to drive complexity out of endpoint security, but also to drive efficacy into endpoint security. And the bigger truth is my summary and conclusion, and then I'll turn it over to Brett. So if we go to the next slide, what we've seen over the last several years is proof, um, really um, inarguable proof that legacy endpoint security solutions are really failing. And you can see the, the narrative there. Most, or, most enterprise organizations use an assortment of point tools for endpoint security, but this strategy is proven to be ineffective and uh, inefficient. Roughly what we see with our research is uh, most organizations, at least in the enterprise, have four to six agents on their endpoints. Uh, endpoint security is a shared task between security and IT operations. And um, endpoint security, as well as just about everything in the security domain, is suffering because of a global cybersecurity skills shortage. So all of those things combine to really lead to some of these conclusions. But with specific to endpoint security, what we've seen is really poor efficacy. So AV, legacy AV, was in the, and, and depending on whose numbers you believe, but roughly in the 50% uh, efficacy rate. So in other words, legacy endpoint security would detect and hopefully block about 50% of security attacks. And um, aside from that, you can see security now analysts suffer from alert fatigue. So there are too many tools and they're all giving off alerts and there are too many false positives. I will say with efficacy, we really saw this a few years ago, um, and I remember talking to healthcare organizations. Once the Anthem attack happened, every healthcare organization, uh, business people were going to cybersecurity uh, professionals and saying, are we vulnerable to this type of attack? And there was a lot of uh, companies that said, yes, we are vulnerable, and they decided that they needed to make necessary changes. Now we've seen that across industries as well, but this has been happening for like the last four years, as I said. There's also too much complexity in um, endpoint security. So we talked about multiple agents, disparate data sets kind of to manage the, the same entities and too many vendors involved. So if I have four to six agents, I may have four to six products from four to six vendors. That, that really doesn't scale very well. And then the lack of integration, I would say, is both historical and cultural. So from a historical perspective, cybersecurity grew organically from the time we started plugging our, our companies into um, to the internet. 
And so I added defenses as I needed to as threats changed. Um, but that led to this issue of multiple tools, multiple agents on devices. And then culturally, culturally, um, cybersecurity professionals are trained to look for best of breed tools. And that's fine, but when I have five best of breed tools that don't talk to each other, how best of breed can that be? We don't have good solid integration, so we're relying on people to be in the middle of, of those tools. Now, before I go to the next slide, think of the cumulative effect here. So a lot of organizations have pure, uh, poor efficacy of their endpoint security, they have too much complexity in their environment, and they have a lack of integration of tools. Cumulatively, that's going to be a really, really big problem, and that's not uncommon. So complexity and this lack of e efficacy is driving consolidation. And ESG research reports 91%, so think about that, a vast majority of organizations are either actively consolidating endpoint management vendors, and this really should be endpoint security vendors, or considering doing so, 44% are actively consolidating. So think of this as sort of a maturity model. These are the leading edge companies, uh, and they are looking to get a single agent. They're looking to consolidate security and IT operations functions. They may be looking to consolidate security activities across PCs and mobile devices, but there, there is this active consolidation going on. 32% are a little bit behind that. They probably have pilot programs going for consolidation on a limited basis. Um, and 15% are considering consolidation. So the general trend, think of this trend as going from right to left. And so we're, we're on the cusp of active consolidation across all kinds of organizations. So that means tools will be eliminated, vendors will be eliminated, and there'll be a concerted effort to go to either integration through APIs or what we're seeing more is integrated suites from single vendors. So that's happening now. This is really what we're here to talk about. So AI and machine learning changing the game, not only in endpoint security, but across the security domain in general. And there's a couple of reasons why I'd say. One is security people tell me all the time, we need quick wins. Meaning there's only so many projects we can do that are resource intensive. So we need new types of innovative technologies that add a discernible improvement or create a discernible improvement once installed. ESG, we call this advanced prevention, but the, the, the thing is we need to do, we need to get more out of our tools. And a lot of this is to, uh, for better efficacy, but it's also to decrease the attack surface. The data here indicates 51% of organizations are currently or planning on investing in big data, analytics, machine learning, predictive analysis, or analytics. Um, and those are the people who I think are, are looking at this kind of as a discrete function, but big data analytics, machine learning, predictive analytics will come in and are coming in through the back door <coughs> in existing products. And organizations are sort of easing their way into this, uh, but there's, there, if they do this in a diligent way, they're getting lots of results um, and they need help. They need help from experts like Silence. So some of the bullet points here, um, Machine learning is recognized as a, uh, a valuable approach to detecting attacks. We know that machine learning can prevent both known and unknown threats, so you don't need traditional signatures in all cases um, because we can understand based on the behavior of attackers, the behavior of malware, um, whether something is benign or malicious. And we minimize the need for static behavioral rules and static behavioral rules, as you all know, um, they're effective, but there's a process there. The malware has to be discovered. It has to be analyzed. We have to write countermeasures to them. We have to distribute those countermeasures. So if we can do that without that process, we're ahead of the game. And the goals here are better protection, reduce signal to noise ratios, increase productivity for the security team. Those are all the goals that we're seeing companies plan for, and we're seeing achievements with, um, a, like I said, a diligent and a thoughtful application of machine learning. So if we go to the next slide, machine learning and security, uh, the first obvious 
answer and or our, our use cases, especially with uh, in this kind of context walk, talking with silence, is threat prevention. So if efficacy can go from 50% to 90%, which we've seen, boy, are we doing a lot to prevent threats. And if we prevent threats, then we don't need processes for detection or tools for detection. And the processes there are investigations, uh, which are typically very um, resource um, heavy. So we want to do more prevention. And this is a quick win, as I said. So properly applied and tuned, machine learning provides the context we need to reduce the risk of a breach while significantly increasing the cost of an attack. That's key as we want to make the cost of an attack more, uh, we wanna make attacks more costly. Um, oftentimes that means that we won't be attacked, that maybe our neighbor will be attacked. But we do want to make the, the bad guys work as hard as they can. And detection, um, we will use supervised machine learning typically uh, because we do have the data. We're getting better at data modeling and testing and fine tuning our models and enhancing our models over time so we can detect anomalous, su suspicious, and malicious behavior uh, with a great degree of accuracy. And I should also say here, fidelity is key. We get tons and tons of alerts and we have to chase down which ones are the highest priority and how to investigate those alerts. If we could add fidelity to that with detection with machine learning, um, and we know which are our highest priority alerts, and we know the breadcrumb trail which led to those alerts and sort of the aggregation of alerts, then we're ahead of the game. And that's really the, the promise that I see with machine learning for threat detection. Now, we see this in our research, and I'm sure Silence will talk about this, but it's all about optimizing endpoint security. So better efficacy, better efficiency. And the power of AI and machine learning is a big part of that. So there are three components I'll talk about. So attack surface protection and decreasing the attack surface, um, a unified architecture and self-contained security. So again, being able to deploy something and not rely on processes, updates, things like that for improved security. Attack surface protection. So prevent malware from executing. This is where machine learning really shines. It's an obvious goal, but improving that efficacy from in the 50% range to the over 90% range is really key. That will free up a lot of resources uh, that will decrease the attack surface, all the things that we've talked about as goals. So that's kind of the key, and that's, like I said before, that's what drove all of the healthcare organizations to really invest, reinvest in endpoint security after the Anthem breach. Uh, control how and where scripts are run. A lot of malware is uh, fileless, and so we have to be diligent on where scripts can run. We have to restrict their ability to get into system resources. And we have to, again, apply rules or apply machine learning algorithms to improve the efficacy of fileless malware. Detect, detect attempts to exploit memory. Um, we've seen anti-exploit technology in uh, chipsets. We've seen it in operating systems. And endpoint security has to play a role. So understanding really from an attacker perspective in what's going on and being able to spot that behavior before it does something like uh, exploits a vulnerability. So as we all know, patch management and uh, vulnerability management is a slog. It's uh, an overwhelming task. If, if endpoint security can help us there, bridge that gap between vulnerability discovery and patching with some very good anti-exploit technologies and protecting memory, that's really important. Control of USB devices, sort of a legacy function but really important and especially important to prevent insider attacks. So we want better visibility into what people are doing with USB devices. And we also want to control what they can do with what devices. Um, we see a lot of companies really still investing in that are still building processes or policies on USB controls. And so that's still an important part of attack surface protection. And then protecting fixed function devices using things like whitelisting. So think of 
point of sale systems, uh, medical devices, kiosks. Whitelisting is still valuable in, but in the right application. And fixed function devices really are that application. So this is what we want from optimized endpoint security for attack surface protection. We also want a unified architecture. So an analytics foundation built from the ground up on AI and ML. The key word there for me is foundation. So we want to use that for all of our analytics. So proactive analytics, analytics presentation to the analysts themselves, uh, streamlining what we can do or what information we need, and then separating the false positives from uh, the false negatives, uh, giving us the high fidelity alerts, things like that. We want a single agent designed for low overhead, uh, requiring fewer memory, uh, requiring less memory, it should say, uh, processing resources and storage resources. You know, a lot of organizations I talk to say, well, we, we don't mind managing all these agents until they really dig under the covers and realize how much overhead there is. Um, and the overhead is not only the security team, it's the IT operations team who have to deploy and then manage the systems. Um, so a single agent makes a ton of sense. And of course, we want it to consume as few resources possible. We really want it to be transparent to end users. And in the past, when we've layered on agents, there's contention, um, and oftentimes they did cause uh, resource constraints. So this is really important, and it, it, I would encourage everyone on the call as they look at next generation endpoint solutions to really qualify and test what the agent, uh, the agent resources require. So agent deployment, agent overhead, uh, and then agent interference with user activity. Tightly integrated endpoint security applications, um, in this case we say designed as microservices with API sets. Integration is key. We want all of these things to work together. So if we can't prevent an attack, we want to detect it very accurately. And we want a feedback loop to build another prevention uh, rule set or some kind of a whitelist that we can share or a blacklist in this case that we can share with other devices. So very important, and we're seeing more innovation around these tightly integrated solutions. And then simplified deployment and management. I'll go back to really my pet issue. We have a serious, serious cybersecurity skill shortage. ESG research says 53% of organizations say they have a problematic shortage of cybersecurity skills. I just finished another project with ISSA, the Information Systems Security Association. In that project, or in that report, which is available on our website, 74% of organizations said that they're being impacted by the cybersecurity skills shortage. So complexity is the enemy of security. We have to simplify our deployment. We have to make solutions easier to use. Um, we have to share that ease of use with IT operations. And then finally, self-contained security. We need to maximize our security tools and they have to be designed with the understanding of what cyber attackers are doing, what their behavior is. is. They need pre-execution excellence. So before we even execute a file or, or render or, or use a script, bring a script into uh, memory, we need to understand what the context of it is and whether it represents some type of threat. So the bullet points here are security that does not require signatures, the cloud, or any information. Um, those things work. Those are worthwhile in some instances. But the more self-contained the security is, the more self-aware uh, and self-driving it is, um, the less interference, the less overhead it will require. And then capable of making autonomous decisions. Um, a lot of security people don't trust these autonomous decisions, but there are some autonomous decisions that are just slam dunks, and we have to be willing to let our technology do some of the lifting for us. Now, of course, we have to get comfortable with that. We have to test it, but it's important that we look at solutions that have this ability. And of course, the big takeaway here is AI and machine learning make this possible. So organizations really should explore these technologies test them, understand them, get comfortable with them.
So the bigger truth is my summary and conclusion, and then I will turn it over to Brett. So pure and simple, endpoint security is broken. The way we've done things in the past is inadequate based on the complexity of our environments, the scarcity of resources, and the sophistication of adversaries. So we need innovation here. We need new types of solutions. And going back to the past, disparate solutions are difficult to deploy and operate. And as we've seen through our research and through a lot of third-party research, um, the efficacy of that strategy isn't very good. Uh, I'll skip the third bullet because it's sort of repetitive, but endpoint security platforms should and really must offer a single modern platform, open APIs, microservices, and a single agent. That's, that's where we are in terms of software development, in terms of ease of deployment, ease of use, ease of scale, ease of integration. And so endpoint security has to follow that model. And as we said throughout this presentation, and Brett will reinforce, uh, machine learning has become a foundation of not only endpoint security, but beyond. So network security, security analytics. We're getting to, the, to really close to being much more efficient at predictive analytics. It's so being able to anticipate new types of threats based on old types of threats, malware behavior, adversary behavior, timing, vulnerabilities, et cetera. We don't have to depend on machine learning but we should get comfortable with it and we should understand how it can make our jobs easier, more effective and more efficient moving forward. So with that, thank you very much. I really appreciated being part of this and let me turn it over to Brett now to talk um, Silence and BlackBerry. Hey, thanks, Sean. Marvelous presentation and really great to, to read the findings that ESG had and great to identify a problem, but it's, you know, more important to, uh, uh, to have a solution. So I identified three, you know, we could talk all day on this, but let's, let's jump right in. So if you're not familiar with BlackBerry Silence, or maybe it's been a while since you've uh, come across this, fundamentally, you know, if I were in the elevator and I had 10 seconds to say uh, what we do, we make software, uh, cybersecurity software that in a pre-execution mode blocks cyber attacks on the endpoint in real time. And we do that using uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. And we'll talk about what that means and how that contrasts uh, with other approaches here moving forward. But the first one that really resonated with me is what John indicated is, hey, uh, John cited a, about a 50% efficacy rates of, of legacy type approaches. And from what I found, uh, sometimes you can approach, you know, maybe uh, up to 70, 71% efficacy. But, you know, is that good enough in an era whereby malware is propagating to the tune of 450,000 new, uh, well, signatures for one thing, but a variance per day? And is that good enough when, you know, your most important information or your most, most important asset, which is, as I see it, your, your corporate information, i.e., if you're Coca-Cola, you got the secret to, you know, how to make Coke. If, if you've got your customer list, you know, anywhere but on a piece of paper, that's your most important asset. And how do we protect that? Is 71, 72% on a great day good enough? Or might that be a better opportunity to provide security? And moreover, give you business continuity. What that means, and I, I pause there for, for, for an operative term, do tomorrow what you're doing today with less risk. Here I'm going to tell you a little bit about what our founder, Stuart McClure, did when, when he was considering going to market with a new type of technology. So Stuart worked for uh, McAfee for many years by nature of an acquisition they made through a company he founded called Foundstone in Southern California. Stuart is a great speaker, and he's written a book that's been edited and, and ordered it a few times. I think it's on its eighth or ninth edition right now called Hacking Exposed, so recognized expert. When he was working for McAfee, he would often do tours and speaking engagements. The one that caused him to found Silence and eventually be acquired by BlackBerry was a conversation he had in upstate New York about 10 years ago, and it went something like this. He, he was in a, a uh, he's on the podium in front of about 100 security engineers and practitioners, and someone stopped him in the middle of his dissertation and asked him, Stuart, stop what you're doing now, 
turn your laptop around and show me what you're running in your system tray for endpoint security. And Stuart, you know, kind of laughed and he, he, he didn't really feel comfortable with answering the question for the reason that will soon become manifest. The audience member was insistent. He says, I don't want to hear another word you say until you turn that around and show me what you're running in your system tray. And Stuart says, all right, I got to confess. I know I work for McVeigh and you're going to find this odd, but I don't run endpoint security on my laptop. And a hush went over the crowd, as you might imagine. How, how does he get around policies to do that? How does he, how can he possibly feel secure about having his data on a PC with no endpoint protection? And what he said was, I have been doing this long enough whereby I can look at a portable executable file and determine in very short order by looking at its fundamental DNA, you know, a few lines of code, is this safe to run or not with very high confidence? And he started thinking about how on the flight home, you know, that's, that's important information. How might I get that out to a broader audience, encapsulate that? And he came across an idea that uses artificial intelligence and machine learning. So with that, let me pause a moment here and talk about old versus new. And this is a traditional signature-based approach. And we're going to talk about the changes and why it's important today, and then map that back to some of the problems of efficacy, complexity, and integration that, that John talked about in his discussion. So what you're really purchasing is a subscription to a daily or sometimes twice daily DAT file, which is, which is a virus definition file. I know I'm speaking to security pro professionals here, so I won't bore you with running you down how they're developed and all, but on a very high level, you have to physically have them. You can't just know about them or read about them or of what they're doing. You have to have the, the virus. At that point, your lab, you know, all the brands have AV labs by which they triage and classify, and then they apply a, a human intelligence to either develop a signature file or throw it up in the cloud, at which point you then, as a customer, get that DAT file. This is kind of a day in the life of now a security administrator. At that point, when you get them once or twice a day, if you're wise, you probably test them. The reason you test them is because you know occasionally a file that is needed for you know typical running of your PC or, or your Mac in the, in the case of that, even a Linux piece, might be quarantined, in which case you've been, if you haven't tested them in your lab, you've bricked a good number of your PCs and zap productivity and all the nasty downstream bits that come as a result of that. If you do happen to pass that test and you didn't brick PCs, then you deploy the signature and you feel secure and go about and you sometimes you do it later that afternoon you get to do it all again the next morning because every day you get upwards more than 400,000 variants of a piece of malware today the reason that this was effective was because back in the day we didn't have as much ways to access our data nor did we have the sheer propagation of variants that we describe today a ransomware malware all the types of things we know about today even things like Pet you, not pet you, want to cry that are more global than, say, a targeted attack. Those are the two things that changed that made this way outmoded. The first was, as I mentioned before, the way we get to our data, it's not just the client server anymore. Now it's the cloud. Now it's mobile. Even contractors coming in and working on our system that are viable, but heck, you don't know what they did last night on their PC that may be lying in wait for you to connect into your, your infrastructure. So things we battle with as security practitioners all the time. At the end of the day, this aligns to John's initial point of poor efficacy. So back in the day, that was the only way to take care of it was a traditional approach whereby you're working through your DAT files. Things have changed and required Stuart to consider a new way of going about it. And let me describe you really how we do what we do. So a lot of people ask me how we develop the technology, how, what's actually being done. And this is how we develop what's called a math model. The math model is developed in the cloud by taking known good files and known bad files and breaking them down to their fundamental DNA. Meaning you can look at a portable executable file and I think there's upwards of 4 million attributes that you can look at discreetly as well as some in combination with the others, i.e. how recent is this file? How large is this file? Is it a fairly simple innocuous file that's really large? Is it a file whereby the opening of them starts with a table of contents? And if you opened up the PE file table of contents, again, if it were human readable, and it said chapter 7 starts on page 80, you leap forward to page 80 and you see chapter 13, you think one of two things. Either someone's pulling some shenanigans 
or there's a mistake that's been made. In either event, this is indicative and it's one of those elements of a bad file that we use to develop that machine learning algorithm and distill that down into the math model you see with a nifty little brain picture. So that's what we do. There's about 1.7 and 1.8 discrete elements that we look at. Some of those discretes are combinations of two, you know, the recency as well as the size or things like known packers that are used commonly associated with uh, malware. If this uses a packer in combination with one or two other elements I mentioned before, it has a statistical probability of being higher, more associated with a conviction of malware. So that's really the dirty little secret about how we do it. The challenge is that to crunch that math, you have to do a lot of calculations. And before five years ago, the advent of say AWS and the cloud computing wasn't really available. So with that advent came our ability to, to crunch massive, massive terabytes of data to get that math model. And like any statistical analysis, if you ask enough questions, you can determine with very high confidence to the tune of above 99% the answer to one simple question, and that is this. Is this file safe to run? And you can do that before you even execute it. You don't need to execute the file, meaning you don't need to compromise an endpoint, or you don't need to send it in the cloud and say, okay, we're gonna take a look at this and poke and prod at it for a while, or are we gonna look at it in a behavioral or a heuristic manner to determine? You can look at it and know with high confidence using a statistical analysis and a math model, is this safe to run or not? Now, the last point I'll make here before moving on is when I say deploy it to endpoints, we don't deploy that entire math model, obviously. No PC could or Mac could handle that. We distill that down to a very portable agent and it's a single agent, to John's point about complexity and managing other agents. This is not a series of agents you need to run and, and update every, you know, periodically. On top of that, it's a very small and compact agent, and it doesn't need to be updated daily. So this is, this is how it's done in from a security administrator's point of view. And the machine learning algorithm is developed in the process that I, I just mentioned before from the math model. It sent out when you deploy silence, you deploy that math model and you don't update that daily. You don't suffer through daily deep scans. I think I've been here, as I mentioned, about three months. I think we've been through three updates to our math model. We don't update for updating sake. We update if we feel we can improve the efficacy of the model. So the idea there is even zero day malware, meaning malware that's never seen of a light of day before, that doesn't have a signature that's associated with it is prevented. And we call that the predictive advantage. Let me give you a quick example of that before we move on. If you were to look at something like WannaCry and look at when that hit and the whole world took notice and a lot of people lost a lot of data and information, look at your typical signature-based vendor and look at their next day's data file and file updates. You'll notice that there is an update. Silence didn't have to do that. The reason for that is because old math models, things that were built even before I was here, prevented against that. And the reason it does that is because it doesn't look for a signature. What it looks at is those fundamental strands of DNA in your PE file, and it conducts that math model and says, yes, we can convict this based upon the statistical analysis. So I said a lot there, that's about as technical as I'll get for this run. This is the second one that, that really resonated with me, and I'll tell you why. For many years, I would come into the office about 8.05, I plug in my PC, and I would immediately go get a cup of coffee. The reason I did that is because I knew for the next 9 to 10, sometimes 12 minutes, my PC was going to go through what's called a daily deep scan. It was scanning every file that I've got for changes, and it would identify files that needed to be quarantined. So, and when you look at things like if you add up the number of ploys that, that boot up a PC every day, and then multiply by the, the number of minutes, that's productivity you're, you're missing. And it may seem 10 minutes, ah, who cares? At the end of the day, that's real money. And we, a very bright guy that I work with named Brian Robison did a study uh, not too long ago. What he did was he said, you know, I know that PCs are really good at math. And I know that while they can accomplish deep scans and file comparisons, it really grinds my PC to a halt, just like what I was talking about with my coffee break. But I'd like to quantify that. So what he did, and I would offer, if you want to look at the study, I've got this data. We published it about a year ago, I guess. He took a look at three different PCs, a low end, a medium, and a high end. 
at three different stages of what they were doing, you know, at rest, doing your typical and doing a grind on a high computational math algorithm. Indeed, what we were finding was a significant advantage, meaning over all the workloads, over all the levels of PCs, computers are good at doing math and they don't bog down and they don't give you the opportunity to go have that cup of coffee. And moreover, they don't compromise corporations' productivity by waiting that out. So the way they found was the best way to portray this was a multiplier type effect, meaning what is the multiplier that we found associated with these deep scans at different variations. So I'll leave it at that, but I would encourage, if this is interesting to you, if you want to dive deeper on, give me an email. I'm happy to walk you through the entire report and send it to you as well. If you're the guy who's trying to uh, maximize productivity, this is real money and to the tune of about $1,000 per employee if this does it. Uh, if you get daily deep scans every day. And I got to tell you, sometimes 10 minutes it was I'd come back and the thing was still chugging through. So re-imaging. Up here in Oregon, the largest private employer is Intel. I worked for them twice, actually. One as employee of McPhee and one as an Intel employee. Let me tell you what would happen when you called the help desk. <laughs> so if you found your, your PC wasn't functioning properly, usually you would have one of three options. One is, okay, bring it down to the lab, which in the case of Intel was about two blocks away. They'd have a two-hour type of a grind where they'd look at it. They would undo what you did. Maybe you clicked on a Excel spreadsheet and you it had added macro you weren't aware of. It started the exfiltrating password, you know, key logging. The second category was, no, we're going to need about a two-day lab work because we've got a queue and we, we need to get your PC in here. So we're going to have you come in, bring it, leave it for two days. We're going to issue you a, a loaner here that, you know, may give you basic functionality but not access to your files. And we're going to bare metal restore, which is the term actually they'd use was ghost, which is ghost is actually, for those of you who are long in the tooth, it's a Symantec software that basically wipes and bare metal restores machines. So they called it ghosting. If you're a techie or a lab guy, you probably are familiar, or familiar with that term. The third method is, holy cow, we don't know what you did. And it's so nasty, we're going to take your PC and grind it up. <laughs> in a little bitty pieces and issue a new one. Now, each of those had different costs associated with it. So what we found is that grinding up or each of those buckets of cost centers had a cost associated with it. And we found the same thing in a recent report we did with Forrester called the DEI, but it's a total economic impact of both Protect and Optics as a security suite. Uh, Protect is our core protection technology, as, as the name would imply. It's, I like to say prevention because it's actually doing more prevention than uh, protecting is a function of prevention. And then Optics, which is our EDR technology. The neat thing about this is Optics was a purpose-built EDR. It wasn't a bolt-on uh, afterthought or an acquisition. This is a product that was built with our AI model in mind, meaning how can we leverage our artificial intelligence and math model-based prevention technology with a more effective EDR? Let me tell you what customers are, are, are asking for me. Most people, if you've got a SOC, you've certainly got an EDR. But what they don't have time for, because as John mentioned, the cyber skill shortage is very high. To be an EDR specialist, you're not the guy that gets hired off of Craigslist. You're the guy that probably started out distributing DAT files and got good at, say, hunting and killing, looking for SHA 264s or MD5s, that type of thing, and therefore got promoted as the EDR specialist, which I would say, parenthetically, is the most expensive guy in, in the SOC. He's the guy whose time is parceled out by the moment. To optimize that fellow's time, to cut things like machine re-imaging, People are looking for a solution that is integrated and that works well together. And let me tell you, just in closing, how we work well together. If you have a prevent first EDR, meaning you're not looking through every piece that you find in a hunting and killing mechanism, but you're targeting these highly security relevant data in your EDR findings, you're not looking for a needle in a haystack. And I, I overuse that term, but it's more like dropping a needle in your pocket jamming your fist in, you do that once or twice, you're going to find it and it's going to be painful. Same thing with a, uh, the inverse of that, I guess, with a targeted approach. If you have a prevent first mantra, you're not remediating and targeting things that are less security relevant than what EDR practitioners are really searching for. So this is the other offering I'll, I'll give you is we've got this study. It's brand new. I think it's literally two weeks old. The ink is still drying on the, on the pixels on the screen. Would love to send it to you and get your thoughts on it. And it'll support some of what John and I were dating, specifically efficacy 
too much too much complexity within the system. You know, I can't manage multiple agents. I mean, I can't have security pieces that aren't talking to each other. I need some synergies between my EDR and my primary protection mechanism. This is a quantification of the benefits, but this will be in the in the paper that we send you. So with that, I'm going to close out by just stating what it is we do and what we don't do. These are actual customers. These are, and this is in the report too, so I won't bore, bore you with the details, but this was validating. This wasn't unprompted. This was people coming back with saying, yeah, what you offered was actually what we found. What I'd like to close with is just a summary. And I find sometimes the best way when I'm talking with dive null security people is to talk about what we do versus what we don't. And sometimes people find this a bit foreign uh, because people expect that everyone has to do human classifications or heuristics or throwing something up in the cloud. You know, that was the only way to do things before AI came along. Uh, You know, AI has been around for a long time, but applied to a security mechanism, it's a relatively novel approach, you know, four or five years old. So no signatures, as I mentioned, no daily data files you're distributing once or twice a day, no behavioral analysis, no update or daily deep scans. Micro virtualization refers to throwing uh, something up in the cloud or a you know, a cloud sandbox. All that pain, all that thrash and anguish and time wasting of resources is gone. Moreover, uh, taking the human equation out, not making them distribute that files or make the call in the, in the cloud on the sandbox by analyzing that malware at the fundamental DNA level. We talked about those elements of the PE file that we can look at really offers that advanced threat protection, meaning you can have that inherent advantage of being protected by old models because it's not waiting for someone to write a signature. We talked about updates. You know, this is, I think we're on my third in three years, very minimal updates and only updated when the math model gets better. We've all, we all travel. I'll be on a plane tomorrow and I don't want to compromise my security by not being online, meaning I don't need to have a connection for this to work fine because that math model is distilled down to that very small agent that's common with EDR agent as well. So not two agents. What does, what does that give you really prediction and prevention? Again, I'm just so rewarded to know that what John's finding are the problems we're solving. People are still talking about poor efficacy. People are still talking about complexity and the lack of integration that actually contributes to that complexity. It's a big problem. And I hope I've showed you some ways in which silence is addressing that. If not, I'll open it up to questions and and do my best here uh, to answer them. I haven't written a line of code since 1982 when my dad brought home a Trash 80 computer. And I had a little ball bouncing back and forth because I wrote it in basic. But if there's something that's more technical, I hope you don't mind if I research and get back with you. But let's open it up for questions. Thank you, Brett. And thank you, John. So we, have, we do have a couple of questions that have come into the Q&A tool. The first question is, is malware or not really a yes or no safe to run conviction? Could there be files that are just annoying? such as take up 20% of resources when they run without benefit to the user? And if so, what do we do about them? Yeah, that's a great question. We, the term we use here is when we look at a system, there we, we call it a pup. That was a new term to me before I came here. And I thought, what is a pup? Well, a pup is a potentially unwanted program, meaning it may have value within a security system if it's used for the right reasons, if it's used for the benefit of the company, but it can also be a scripting program that is used by, uh, let me give you an example. A scripting program would be a tool that would be common for someone to use. However, if we start noticing by nature of using our EDR software that the scripting program was seen by, say, HR manager, who had escalated privileges in the middle of the night and is now exfiltrating data to Dropbox in a third world country. And oh, by the way, that HR manager happened to be on vacation. Obviously, that's you know where the line becomes a, a little grayer. So you can tweak those and anything you could script, actually, you can run within EDR. We do take those into account and probably beyond the scope of this discussion, but a good one for next time would be how we use our CAE rules within EDR to find those type of problems and take into account that safe to run conviction idea if thought up. We have one more question is some vendors other than Silence say that they use ML and AI. How can we identify these characteristics? Thanks for bringing that up. I found the same thing too. It sounds like you've been to the same RSA trade shows that I have. 
And here's the way that I look at it. When you look at AI, you know, AI has been around for a long time. When you look at things like Netflix, you know, how does Netflix know that because I liked Game of Thrones, I'll also like, you know, Jaws 3? Well, it's because it runs AI analysis, a, a machine learning analysis, and it says, okay, here's a large body of people who have identified these, who have watched these shows and identified these as ones they like. It's not a new technology. It's been around for quite some time. However, applying it to a security mechanism uh, is new. Tell me what your AI is doing for your security practitioner. What I found is a data scientist, they oftentimes don't know, because that's something here all the time, but Usually what the answer I find is that it's there to support their existing mechanisms. And let me give you an example. The market share leader for antivirus product recently about, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so, brought in an AI mechanism to, one, support their existing signature base, but two, claim they could use AI because that was a current buzzword. And here's what we found when we peel back the layer of the onion. While they did have AI, they were looking at a whopping total of two elements. Those two were one of the ones I mentioned before. They use AI to, to determine if that piece of malware had a packer or not that was associated with malware. So to claim to use AI is fine, but really the question is, tell me what it's doing. It's supporting their, their primary method of conviction. The distinction there between what, what they do and what we do is we are 100% AI based on our convictions. We don't, we don't look at, as I mentioned before, we don't have sandbox, we don't have heuristics, we don't have signatures as our primary with AI as coming back and checking for one or two elements of packers. We only convict malware based on AI. If you want to talk in that deeper, I'm happy to engage with you. Reach out to me via email to go into a deeper, broader conversation. Thank you, Brad. We got one more question that just came in. If silence doesn't block 100% of threats, what, if anything, can be done to block the remaining unblocked trees? The first challenge I came up with was, heck, no one can ever be 100% effective. And I, I can't even tell you the reasons why. As you approach more of a high efficacy rate toward the 99%, you've got a far more finite type of uh, solution set to conquer. But that's not enough. Because the data is your primary asset, it's more important than cash in the bank. It's not good enough to say we've got 99 and you know, good luck with the other one. The Silence Optics platform we launched about a year ago is our EDR tool. For those of you who may not be dyed in the wool SOCA experts, is an endpoint detection and response tool. I think of the functionality as twofold. The first is hunting, the ability to look across your entire infrastructure and identify what you're looking for, usually SHA-1 or MD5 or running processes, artifacts of that nature. But the other is to do something about it. And I used to say kill. But killing is such a strong term. There's so many other things you can do for remediation beyond killing. So things like you can do nothing. For example, if you know that this node is doing something that's viable, maybe he's a lab guy looking at you know what's happening with this piece of malware, you can do nothing. You can watch it for a while. You can say, okay, this looks sketchy. I want to find out what he's doing. Where is he doing lateral movement? Did he just make a mistake? Before he does something dangerous, we'll act, but I want to find out what's going on. You can, for example, relegate to tertiary storage. Okay, we want this guy to believe that he's got access to the keys to the kingdom, but we don't necessarily want to kill his connection because we want to learn from what he's doing so that we can go back and make changes later to enhance our security. Or even before the most dire is killing the connection. Okay, yeah, this is not right. We're at risk here of losing some data or getting you know, infected. Let's just kill the connection, have the guy bring his PC in and do some analysis and make things better. So that's a long answer to a short question is we do have an EDR product called Silence Optics. It does a number of things for you, but moreover to your question, it's the answer when a piece of malware gets through in that very short and, and small occurrence. Hopefully that answered your question, Mark. If not, again, I'm at your service. Would love to engage with you offline, phone call, email, whatever meets your needs. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, John and Brett, Thanks, for your team. time today. Yeah, it's My been an honor to speak you. with you. Thank you all. Have a great day.